Chapter 7 The brooding mass of Klausner Keep seemed to swallow Thulman and his companions as they rode through the black gates. Once again, the witch hunter had the impression of a vast and noxious toad squatting atop the hill, surrounded on all sides by a wretched and diseased forest and the crumbling relics of a bygone age. Even in daylight, the unpleasantness of the small courtyard and the black stone walls was not lessened. Gregor Klausner conducted the witch hunter and the henchman into the vast entry hall, leaving the horses to be tended by servants. The young noble turned to speak with Fulman as he led the way. The library is located on the northern face of the keep. The records we want to examine will be found there, he explained. The young noble turned as he saw the black clad shape of Ivar Cole descending the broad staircase. Excuse me, please, he told the witch hunter. Ivar Cole regarded Fulman with an oily look, a false smile forcing itself to his features. He continued to descend the stairway as Gregor hurried towards him. Master Gregor, the steward addressed the noble. I trust that your morning has been productive. My father, Ivar, how is he? The steward adopted a posture not unlike that of a lecturer delivering a dissertation. Well, Ivar began, your father is not a young man. I am afraid that the excitement and tragedy of the scene in the hollow has upset him greatly, and the chill of the morning has disordered his humours. He is not so resistant to the caprices of temperature as he once was, Ivar stated regretfully. I should go to him, Gregor declared. The grin on Ivar's face spread, becoming a touch more genuine. He reached out and gripped the noble's shoulder. Yes, you should, agreed the steward. Your father is resting at the moment, but I am certain that seeing you would do him more good than any amount of sleep. Gregor nodded. He looked back towards Fulman and Strang. I shall only be a moment. I wish to check on my father. He looked back towards the steward. Ivar, please conduct Herr Fulman and his associate to the library. I shall join them shortly. Ivar, conduct those men out of my home. A harsh commanding voice spoke from the top of the stairs. All eyes turned upon the gaunt, sickly figure that stood there. Lean frames waddled in heavy cloaks. Wilhelm Klausner glared down at the witch hunter for a moment, then swung his gaze upon his son. In fact, you can see them out of my district. I don't want them here, scaring the peasants and filling their heads with all kinds of morbid nonsense. Ivar Cole took a reluctant step towards the witch hunter, but a sharp glance from Thulman froze the servant. Thulman advanced to the base of the stairway, looking past Gregor at a skeletal figure that was his father. There is still evil abroad in these lands, your lordship, Fulman said, his silky voice rippling with menace. While it is, there is work for me to do here. Then you refuse to accept my wishes, the old patriarch snapped. That is unwise. Father, interrupted Gregor, climbing the stairs to stand beside his sire. Herr Fulman has come here to help. He has come to undermine my authority, corrected Wilhelm, his lisping voice rising with his anger. Come here to twist the entire district against me with his bogey stories and shadow chasing, but I will not have it. The old man shook his thin hand at Fulman. You forget just who I am, witchfinder. I am no petty burgomaster to be bullied and frightened by your tricks. I am not without my own influence, and I shall bring it to bear upon you if you continue to defy me. The elector count himself has dined within these walls, and I have sat to supper with two emperors. Need I remind you that the Grand Fiogonist is one of my oldest and dearest friends? Wilhelm laughed, a low dry rattle that slithered out of his throat. 
defy me and you will end up burned at the stake yourself as an apostate thulman stood his ground meeting the patriarch's challenging gaze there is a monster at work in your district klausner i will leave when it is ash and blackened bone and not before no threat from you will change that the face of wilhelm klausner turned into an animalistic snarl but before the patriarch could give voice to the invective boiling up within him, another fit of coughing racked his body. Wilhelm crumpled into the arms of his son, allowing Gregor to conduct him back to his room. Thulman washed the two Klausners with jaw and then faced Ivar Cole once again. His lordship is not quite himself, the steward apologized. These killings and his unwise venture this morning have disturbed his thoughts. I will conduct my inquiries in the village today, Thulman told the servant. Perhaps when I return I will find his lordship in a more conciliatory mood. That would be for the best, Ivar Cole nodded his head enthusiastically. I am sure that when this sickness passes you will find his lordship much more agreeable. Thulman lifted a warning finger. Cooperative or not, he said, I will be back. You might relay that information to your master. Turning on his heel, the witch hunter stalked out of the hall. Streng paused to snort derisively as he passed the servant, and then followed his employer into the courtyard. Ivar Cole watched the door close behind the two men, the false pleasantry slipping off his face his usual mask of cunning rising to take its place. Sick or not, Wilhelm Klausner was correct. The witch-hunter was a menace. Possibly one that might have to be attended to in a more direct manner. Still, while the perpetrator of last night's atrocity was still abroad, the witch-hunter might have his uses yet. There was no reason to act in a hasty and irreversible fashion. At least, not yet. Upon his return to the inn, Matthias Fullman found the common room of the Grey Crone crammed with people. As the witch-hunter strode through the door, the excited murmur of the crowd died away, and every face in the building turned in his direction. The witch-hunter scrutinized the crowd, seeing old men stoop with age, and young burly lads beginning to grow their beards. They were garbed in simple homespun or furs, or else in modest fabrics such as can be found clinging to the frame of merchants and traders in any town of the empire. It was a cross-section of Klausberg that faced Fulman, men from the lower classes and men who passed for wealthy in the village. They were men who under normal circumstances wouldn't have deigned to walk the same side of the street as each other. But these were not normal times, and a grim and dreadful common purpose united them and brought them here. Streng muscled his way past the witch-hunter, the thug's hand dropping to the hilt of his sword. The mercenary did a quick count of the sullen, expectant faces looking at him. "'Well, aren't you the popular one?' he muttered to his employer from the corner of his mouth. Streng discreetly removed his hand from his weapon. In a louder voice he said, "'I don't know about you, Matthias, but I could do with some ale to wash away the chill from our ride this morning.' Streng left his master's side and strolled towards the counter, where Reichert stood wiping his hands upon the apron. "'It seems your custom has improved, friend Reichert,' Fulman said in the silky voice. The familiar tone nearly caused the innkeeper to drop the flagon he was handing to Streng. Reichert cast a nervous glance at the mob. "'Can I help you with something, perhaps?' the witch-hunter asked the foremost of the men, a rotund fellow with brightly striped breeches of white and red, and a bronze-buttoned leather vest. Thulmanstone was imperious, and the surly merchant retreated from his gaze. The witch-hunter turned his attention to the man standing beside the merchant. He was tall and black-bearded, bare arms rippling with muscle. Thulman guessed that this man was a blacksmith. Aye, the man said. You can start by telling us what you and those damn Klausners intend to do to stop these murders. With each word, the mob surged uneasily, their courage bolstered as their spokesman gave voice to the source of their fear and outrage. Fulman did not speak at once, but stepped towards the bar, 
leaning his back against the hard wooden surface, adopting a practice pose of unconcern and inoffensiveness. A glass of wine, if you would, Reichertz, the witch hunter told the innkeeper. Red, and in a glass, if that is achievable. Fulman turned around, taking his time to answer the smith's question, allowing the crowd's mood to simmer. He needed these people angry. Anger was a poor cousin to courage, but it would suit his purposes for now. The people were afraid of the thing that was preying upon them, and that fear might keep their lips closed when Fulman needed them at their most active. For my part, the witch hunter said, nodding to Reichertz as the nervous man set his wine down on the counter and scuttled away. I intend to bring a halt to these atrocities. And what about his lordship? An angry voice snarled from the back of the crowd. Fulman took his time to answer, sipping at his wine. Beside him, an increasingly uneasy strength watched the discontent grow in the crowd. As for his lordship, Fulman commented, setting the glass down once more. He is convinced that a wolf is preying upon the district. The statement brought an incredulous murmur from the gathering. In fact, one of his own sons is leading a hunting party to look for the animal, even as we speak. The murmur grew into an angry roar. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Strang asked in a low whisper. Rest easy and continue drowning your wits, Fulman told his underling. Klausner plays games, growled the smith, his deep voice roaring above the crowd. He plays games with our people as they die. Yes, shouted a second voice. He is safe behind his walls with his family, while our brothers and sons, our wives and daughters are dying. Fulman listened to the fury swell within the mob, waiting for the opportunity. Our people die, snarled a third man. Our blood to feed the damn Klausners and their curse. The Klausner curse, Fulman's voice rose above the crowd, projected to the very back of the room, a trick often employed by actors upon the stage and taught to every Templar and priest of Sigmar. The crowd grew silent again, staring once more at a man whom they had come here to confront. I have heard much about this curse, but I know very little. The witch hunter continued when he saw that he had the attention of the room. I have seen for myself the remnants of one of the fiend's victims, a cattleman called Skimmel, who was found in the early hours of this morning. The news brought a shocked gasp from some in the crowd, who had not given full credence to the rumors which had been circulating in the village. His lordship thinks that these crimes are the work of a wolf. I know better. I must know more. Thulman strode away from the bar stepping to the fore of the crowd, keen gaze sweeping across the faces across the room. You, the good folk of Klausberg, are the ones to whom I must turn to, if we are to put an end to these atrocities and bring this fiend to justice. You must tell me all that you have seen, all that you have heard. Fulman let his lean features spread into a grim smile. Together, if we keep our faith in Sigmar, we will overcome this evil. The witch hunter's quick, impassioned words had their effect, and a new murmur, this one of excitement and cautious hope, rippled through the room. Fulman smiled as he watched his handiwork take root. Now he needed to cultivate it and force what he had planted to bear fruit. A small, mousy man broke away from the crowd, nervously approaching the witch hunter. I can help you, Master Witchfinder, the little man said wringing his hat between his hands. You see, I have seen the demon for myself. The little man confessed when he was aware that he had Fulman's attention. At the bar, Strang overheard the little man's story. He grumbled into his ale and drained the last dregs out of his flagon. There are times when I really regret deserting the army, he mused. I have a bad feeling that this is going to be one of them. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but I will be closing early. You're going to have to come back tomorrow. 
the butcher informed a man who had just slipped into his tiny shop. The rebuked customer stood in the doorway of the shop, a perplexed look contorting his pale features. He brushed a ratty string of oily hair from his face as the butcher rounded the counter, tossing his stained apron on the floor. He glanced about the shoddy interior, staring with keen interest at the bisected pig carcasses hanging from the hooks fixed to the ceiling, at a barrel of dismembered chicken refuse that would later be ground into meal for hogs, dogs, and the least discriminatory of the town's human denizens. The smell of blood and the buzzing of flies occupied the visitor's other senses. "'It will only take a moment,' he told the butcher." Some sausage and a bit of pig's blood to boil it in. The butcher shook his head, hastening towards the door and hurrying the robed man before him as though he were a wayward duckling. No time, my friend, the butcher told him. The big man paused, his eyes narrowing as he looked more closely at his guest. I don't think I've seen you here before, he commented with an accusing voice. Humble means... The pasty-faced man returned, shrugging his shoulders in apology and resignation. I fear I cannot often afford decent meat, but must make do with what I can provide for myself. He froze for a moment, staring at a haunch of meat resting on a wooden platter, trying to decide what exactly it had come from. The crawling blanket of flies that clothed a fair portion of it did little to aid his study. The butcher snorted in distaste. Poacher, eh? Lord Klausner will catch you soon enough, rabbit catcher, and then you'll be for it. The man laughed grimly. He might even try to lay the terror on your head if you're not careful. He'd be just as happy to put the blame on a two-legged wolf as a four-legged one. The customer chuckled nervously. That would certainly be an unpleasant turn of events, he muttered. His speech trailed away as he stared at a cow head lying atop a wooden box, its lifeless eyes staring back at him, thick tongue protruding from its dead mouth. All the more reason for me to procure some of your provender, the man hastily said as he saw the butcher advancing towards him. The big man was not moved, pushing his ill-featured patron back out the door. Sorry, friend, the butcher mumbled turning to lock the door to his shop. Afraid you're gonna live on rabbit for a little longer. Big doings at the inn, and I'll not miss a moment of it. Is that so? The pale man asked, glancing in the direction of the grey crone. There was indeed a steady stream of traffic flowing into the building. He tried to recollect his sketchy knowledge of imperial holidays. The festival of St. Ulfgar? he asked, as the butcher completed his job. No, indeed, the butcher scoffed. The witch hunter is there, taking statements from anyone who will give them. The butcher turned, walking quickly in the direction of the inn. Finally, somebody's going to put an end to these killings, he called back as he raced away. Carandini scowled as he heard the villagers' words quickly sheaving the triple-edged dagger he had been holding beneath the voluminous sleeve of his robe. He had feared something like this. Things had been stalemated for several weeks now, but the arrival of the witch-hunter would give a new strength to the enemy. The necromancers scuttled off down the nearest alley, trying to remain inconspicuous. Strangers were common enough in Klausberg, even under the current pole, but he didn't want to take any chances. This close to achieving everything he had hoped for, he was even more paranoid than usual about putting his own neck in jeopardy. The necromancer hastened to where he had tethered his sickly mule and rode off to bring the ill news to his confederate. Night had fallen by the time Carandini returned to his lair, a small and abandoned shack five miles away from the village. Even so, the necromancer was obligated to wait for nearly two hours before his ally put in an appearance. Carandini turned away from the small fire as he heard a swish of clothing behind him. The necromancer could barely make out the white face that rose above his confederate's black clothing, even with his supernaturally keen night sight. 
Carandini rose to his feet, wiping the dirt and soot from the front of his cassock. Forgive my tardiness, the shadow said. Carandini could just make out the movement of the speaker's mouth within the smoky darkness that surrounded him. I was unavoidably delayed. You have not been discovered, demanded Carandini, his hand closing about a small vial he had sewn into the lining of his cloak. I am not so reckless as to jeopardize all that we have worked for, the shadow hissed, his powerful tones redolent with resentment. There is nothing in this world or the next more important than the prize we will claim. A permanent and lasting end to both of us is something that I should hold of greater importance, Carandini snapped. It might be of interest to you to know that a witch hunter has come to Klausberg. You must be more cautious than ever, if it is even suspected. I have known about a witch hunter's arrival for two days now, the other told him. I watched him right from the keep the first night he was here. Carandini rounded on his companion, fury swelling within him, forgetting for a moment even the habitual loathing and fear which his ally caused in his heart. You knew about him and said nothing? The necromancer shouted incredulously. Would you have informed me were our positions reversed? The shadow asked calmly his deeply accented voice twisted with a cruel mirth. Carandini scowled and retreated back towards the fire. There was truth in his ally's words. Carandini would indeed have kept the association to himself, in hopes that he might find some way to use the witch-hunter against his associate when the time came. It didn't disturb Carandini that his companion didn't trust him. Neither of them were such fools as to trust one another any more than a miser would trust a dwarf with his money belt. They were useful to one another for now, but once that usefulness had run its course, their fragile alliance would come to an end, and the one who struck first would also be the one to triumph. No, their mutual capacity for treachery was something of an unspoken understanding between them. What disturbed Carandini was the felicity with which his associate had predicted what shape his plot might assume when the time came. Do not brood so, the shadow hissed. There are ways that we might turn this man's arrival to our advantage. Carandini looked up sharply, face twisted in suspicion. Our mutual advantage, the shape added. Being burned at a stake is not something I should find advantageous, spat Carandini. And I dare say it wouldn't do yourself any amount of good either. We can arrange to dispose of this man, certainly, the shadow hissed, slowly circling the fire. If he hunts a beast, then perhaps we should let him find a beast. But consider this. The voice dropped into a slithering whisper. We might do better than simply kill him. We might direct his attention to where it serves us best. The enemy of our enemy. The figure grew quiet as he considered the idea. His presence here interferes with our plans, stated the necromancer. I had to abandon my choice for the next ritual because of him. The rituals will proceed, the shadow assured Carandini. Nothing can be allowed to prevent them. You will simply have to find another viable sacrifice. However, it is wise to plan for every contingency. Emil Gundolf slowly picked his way through the trees, lips pursed as he whistled a low, mournful tune. He had walked this way many times, yet never had his spirits been so low, his fear so great. Evil was abroad in Klausberg stalking everywhere, striking anyone. It was dangerous to be abroad at night. He cast a nervous look over his shoulder, staring at the now distant light twinkling from his home. He could be at home now, safe and warm beside his wife and children. The thought of his wife and daughters caused the forester to grip his axe a bit more securely. He fastened the top button of his coat and strode onward. Whatever fiend was abroad, it could be no more deadly than an empty belly. Of that Gundolf was certain. And if the blight really had spread from the Klausner estate into Franz Beher's timber, 
then Gundolf could expect a very summary dismissal from Beher when the merchant discovered that his logging grounds had become corrupted. Warned by such grim pragmatism, Emil Gundolf continued to whistle and walk through the maze of rail-thin trunks. He did not see his attackers, for they set upon him in darkness and silence from behind. A heavy hood was slipped over his head before Gundolf could even open his mouth to scream, and powerful hands tore his axe away from him. The forester struggled as he was pushed and pulled, striving to overcome the tremendous strength of his captors. He soon realized that he was no match for those that held him, but Gundolf had no delusion regarding what his fate would be if he allowed them to drag him away. Every step he tried to stamp the feet of his attackers, tried to smash an elbow or a shoulder into the face or stomach of one of his unseen adversaries. Sometimes he was even rewarded by a grunt of pain or a muttered curse. Sometimes the grip upon him would loosen slightly. But never enough. Never would his captors weaken enough to allow him to slip their clutches. Emil Gundol thought about his wife, his tiny twin daughters, waiting nervously beside the hearth, waiting for him to return. Within the glowing darkness of the suffocating hood, the forester shouted, screamed in impotent anguish, but a mask smothered the sounds. Tears welled up in his eyes, dampening the cold leather. After some time, his captors brought him to a halt. Gundolf was gasping for breath beneath the hood, fighting to pull every scrap of air through the heavy leather. Sightless, with his arms now bound at his sides, he was unable to brace himself when the captors threw him to the ground. Gundolf groaned as his foes kicked and rolled his body into position upon the cold, damp earth. That will do, a cold voice spoke from somewhere above him. The last thing Emil Gundolf heard was the sound of his wool shirt being cut open and the wet flop of his guts as they spilled from his torn belly.